thought I'd just uh, start with uh, a few remarks um, <clears throat> on what we're seeing in ID2's um, findings. There's um, most groups have, have uh, quite a lot of strength um, in terms of uh, the basics of some of the functionality uh, that's been implemented. Um, in terms of a uh, fair bit of, uh, of code that's been written, but I have been a um, bit disappointed on, on a couple of fronts that I think you're going to want to really push on um, for coming deliverables. Um, one of them is uh, getting in place some additional tests. Um, uh, the I know uh, the the group uh, group one I think it is um, doing um, <coughs> the Xcode uh, work with um, uh, with uh, Alan McLean as a stakeholder. Um, so, uh, you've got some decent basic tests there, both UI and um, outside of the UI context, programmatic tests, which is encouraging. Um, I'd like to see more of that. Um, that's good. For those uh, in other groups, but also in the same group, I'm not seeing a lot of, lot of tests uh, in general and unit tests in particular of particular functions. I understand group three, for example, um, we're still operating you know, for ID2. Uh, we were operating still with some spike uh, prototypes, uh, fair enough, um, uh, for, for unit testing. On the other hand, at least test planning should be going on, you know, for what, what at a black box level could be tested, because that's black box testing depends on what? It depends on design documents? No, it depends on requirements, typically, black box testing, what the system should do. And so um, at least you could come up with some high-level scenarios of things that you would test that might put the system through its paces. You remember those lectures that I, I delivered on um, state-based testing and covering transitions. Um, you know, thinking through systematically what test cases would cover transitions, would cover, would get you to different states of the whole application. Could be a quite useful and fruitful thing even if, even if the code is not fully written. I, I understand from Nobleman, for example, um, that uh, we had, um, you know, there were there were some code that was still being stubbed out that, <clears throat> you know, he he implemented a stubbed version of it for the sake of some testing and and that's that's great. Um, I'd like to see that but having some mocking instead of that would be an easier reach because it would mean having to write less code that has to be thrown away. Stubbed code, code that's kind of a fake version of what should be done, um, uh, still often takes some time to put together. It has bugs in it, et cetera. And it's safer to use a mocking framework because you can actually declaratively specify for some of the marking frameworks, you know, just mock out this class or mock out these methods, have them return this sort of fixed value or random values, check these constraints, is the second argument non-negative and the third argument should never be null, that sort of thing. Mocking allows you to do that declaratively without having to write code. And that's a real asset when you're, when you're testing. Um, there's mocking frameworks these days for lots of platforms, including JavaScript. So see if you can make use of it. Um, I'm also not seeing much in the way of um, design by contract um, where you're specifying preconditions and postconditions for um, functionality. Um, you know, in my mind, when you go through a design phase, you should be articulating um, a design where you might divide up your system into multiple classes. And I saw this for at least one or two of the of the project, so you have a UML class diagram, and you know the class name here, right? Uh, A, B, C, and you have various methods within this. But <clears throat> there were some issues with what I saw. First of all, if you're going through the work of doing this, which is good work to think that through, and I was happy to see that. If you're thinking, if you're putting in the work to do this, you're going to be wanting to think, of course, about you know, which of these methods depend on this guy or which <laughs> depend on that guy, et cetera. Um, 
you will want to be thinking about the contracts that are provided. In other words, for each of these methods, what are preconditions? What things does it need to do its job? What are the assumptions about the input parameters that it has to have in place to do its job? Or what, what about external resources like, you know, the database has to be populated or, or this data structure has to be initialized that it depends on? So preconditions and specifying post conditions. What is the job of that code? If, if these preconditions are met, um, what job does it accomplish? So post conditions. Um, at least you should be able to specify those for many, if not all, of these methods. Now, why would you do that? Why would it be useful to specify those things? Yes, it's extra work. But why might it save work overall? In the grand scheme of things, might be able to reuse some of the code. Might be able to reuse some of that code. Yeah. Um, so someone who wasn't involved in writing it <coughs> um, and wasn't even anticipating using it later by reading these things, they might be able to realize, oh, that that actually does the job. I wasn't involved in discussions of it, but that actually uh, meets my needs. It actually will lower the communication involved. I won't have to go to the person who wrote it and say, how does this function work? I won't have to go look at its code, which is often needlessly time consuming. I can look at a description of what it does, some, some specification, including preconditions, postconditions, and, and get some sense of how it accomplishes its job. Okay? Um, where else could this be really useful? In what process? Testing. Testing. Because these are the things the testers can get working against. Maybe this code hasn't yet been written. But you could start to write code against preconditions and postconditions. So when this code is available, you know, you can you can test it right away. Um, another thing this is useful for is mocking. Because if you have preconditions, postconditions, you could create mocks that work against this. Uh, another thing yet that this is useful for is writing the code in the first place. If these things are in place when you start to write the code, um, it will sh sharpen your sense of what this code has to, be has to accomplish. So that's one point of, of, of feedback on these class diagrams. Good stuff. I like to see them. Um, like to see more. But I'd love to see preconditions and postconditions. A final thing that they will help is another thing I didn't see in the code base at all. Assertions. I don't at least I don't remember seeing assertions. Maybe one of the teams used them. We're going to be finishing up the um, review of this code tonight, um, so we'll be sending along a batch, a large batch of stuff for Team Two at least, and maybe to some of the other teams possibly. Um, but assertions. You know, Java has a keyword in it. Assert. Right. Um, assert that this certain thing is true. And you can specify after a colon, you can specify a, uh, this is actually a statement in Java. It's not just a function call, it's a statement type. And you can specify a message after it if it fails, what to say. So you say, you know, um, you'll assert, you know, um, hash table dot um, uh, contains some string or something like that. And you'll throw an assertion. Uh, if that's if that's not not the case, okay, um, that it contains some string and otherwise you 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 give a message that's a diagnostic message, and when it throws this, um, if if it if the assertion fails, it'll be identifying where it failed and what module uh, in the stack trace, and uh, I believe in the in what's actually printed out at the highest level. Assertions are good. You can enable them or disable them in the in the shipping code. And there's different philosophies of that. Should they be kept in on the shipping code? They're great for debugging, and they're great for, um, for testing um, during the test phase. Because if your code is broken, you want to know it as soon as possible. Fail early, fail often. If there's something wrong, you don't want it to be silent and deadly. You want to know about it as soon as possible. So assertions are also enabled by specifications, OK? Um, by stating for a given method what the assumptions are of that method, what job it performs. Um, now in 470, for those who continue on to it, you'll hear more about other types of assertions or other 
other types of conditions as well, invariants that are true at all time for a given data structure. Maybe there's no duplicate keys, for example, be an invariant. Um, the data structure is not empty. There's no empty strings uh, as keys for it, what have you. There's no duplicate values in it. Um, invariants and history properties. But if you can just get, um, and you'll find videos of me holding forth on this, including from 470. But if you could just get preconditions and postconditions in place, I'll be happy. Did you see, did you folks see those in 370? You did? Okay, so I wanna see them here, okay? Um, I'd like to see them, uh, see them here. Um, or else I'll get Professor Duchin to mark your, your mark here. here. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, <laughs> you heard it, you know? Um, so uh, I wanna see those in place, okay? Um, Okay, so uh, please, please get this place. Now another point of feedback, okay? Um, I'm sorely tempted, maybe I'll do it next time, maybe I'll do it in a couple times. I'm sorely tempted to call up some code and browse it together and give my feedbacks on that. But I think I'll save that to ID3 probably. That's always a fun exercise. Students like to see me exhibit discomfort and occasionally um, suppress uh, utterances that are not fit for the class um, uh, when I look at code. But um, uh, another thing I did notice in, in these class diagrams in the code, there was an awful lot of reliance on getters and setters, okay? And A and B and C, these classes, they were full of gets and sets and things that are more or less directly, you know, does it contain this or what have you. Um, that's okay. It's okay, but that's not how we generally write good, extensible, clear object-oriented software. Getters and setters are okay, but they're kind of the lowest level denominator of methods. Um, they're, they're kind of the equivalent of what comes along automatically with C, with structures in C, right? You, you get values out of them and you put values into them. And if that's all your class is being used for, to put values in it and to get values out, it's just a glorified structure. That's all it is. What you really want in your classes is the business logic, the, the kind of the underlying domain logic that this class is supposed to encapsulate. And that logic has to exist somewhere in any non in any serious program. The application logic and kind of the, any domain logic associated with with the domain you're dealing with. Maybe it's reserving beds. For, uh, for patients in a hospital. There's a logic to it, of things you can do. You know, someone requests a bed that's already occupied, you can't do it, et cetera. There's domain logic. If, if you've got, um, if you've got uh, a system which is keeping track of the SCOGA, of the, um, the interactive uh, set of things on patients' conditions, you're gonna have some logic involving updating of fields, et cetera. Where does that logic live? If all you've got is data structures that are setters and getters here, uh, it's not clear where that logic lives. It's kind of not inside the normal methods often. Um, and, and often it's just jumbled together at certain places, calling off to this method get, that method put, uh, et cetera. What you really want to do, ladies and gentlemen, is you want to have these classes have high level functionality associated with them. They undertake certain processes. They accomplish certain things with the high-level operations. So beyond getters and setters, you want high-level operations that do substantive, undertake certain actions that are, that are not merely getting and setting, but high-level in character. They change a bunch of things. And what that gives you is cohesion, okay? So the class kind of mostly uses its own internal data structures, updating things and it operates to offer certain services for the world. So you want, beyond getters and setters, you want service methods that do substantive things, that process the data in a certain way and get back some high-level results. And that's what I wasn't seeing in, in some of these class diagrams. A lot of setters and getters, glorified structures, where's the, the substance in terms of the services being offered in terms of the the kind of uh, core domain logic. It wasn't clear. So I'd like to see classes reflect that core domain logic. Um, so uh, try, to work, try to work at that as well, okay? Um, 
What other um, what other feedback? Um, well, um, when you do your hand ins for ID three, um, for those who aren't already doing it, please go back and look at the um, at the syllabus as as to what's uh, required in terms of infrastructure for your projects. Um, things like um, uh, uh, things like a build server. Um, and and source code repository etc make sure you know there's some references to those things um uh, another thing would be inspections right um make sure you document inspections there were some groups that didn't list an inspection but maybe they just neglected to include it in the packet um other things um well if you if you go look at what's expected I'd also like to know like a breakdown of time by different people in the group. How much time do people spend on different tasks? Um, for tasks still to be done for the next deliverable, some of the groups mentioned them, that's great. Um, how much time do you think they'll take? Can you compare the time you thought it would take against the time it's actually taking? Um, code coverage. Um, uh, I did see one or two claims on code coverage. Um, but um, uh, I would like to see greater attention to that side of things, okay? Um, code coverage side. Um, we're getting, you know, for ID3, we should be well into the space where we should be thinking about mocking, thinking about systematic testing, uh, assertions, et cetera. So I'll expect some maturity for that um, in, in ID3, okay? Um, don't neglect the risk side of things. Um, I'm not sure all risk documents are being updated, and risks still exist. What risk exists still very much within this very classroom? Absence. Absence in a big way. Sickness. Deadlines to prevent someone from delivering on, on elements for a given project. Even, if I'm not mistaken, drops could happen. Mm -hmm. So don't write off risks at this point. Don't, don't view that as a past activity that was handed in for ET1. Some of those risks are evolving. Some of those risks are, are, are actually maybe worsening. Um, some are retreating. You've ruled out, like uh, Team 3 has done a bunch of spike prototyping and you know, ruled out certain types of tactical risks that otherwise might have bitten it in, in later forms. Uh, fair enough, that's, um, that's good to, to rule out risks. All of the groups, I think, have gotten far enough along that you you um, you understand Firebase or you you know understand Xcode development. You've ruled out certain risks with that, but there's other risks that are still present. It may be worse. End of term is a is a is a uh, very busy time, and a lot of people might not be available that you're counting on. Okay, so please put in the time to to update those risk documents. Okay. Um, will be uh, completed marking. I want to thank um, uh, thank those who came by our marking session last time. That was actually really helpful to have a dialogue. It was a two-way dialogue um, and it really helped clarify <laughs> understanding as to what what was in place uh, for a given um, given project in a, in a way that I think was was useful and helped us give some feedback that hopefully will will be useful as well. So um, that was good stuff, and we'll be doing some more marking tonight, okay? I think we were here till 9.30 or something um, a few days ago. Um, anyway, I'm, you know, I think there's some strengths to build on, but, um, but there's also a lot of vulnerabilities.